J.P. Machica was born in New Orleans about 1843 to Sicilian immigrant parents. His father, an outlaw known only by the alias of Peter Carvana, was sentenced to life in prison when J.P. was a young boy. His mother, Marietta, married Joseph Machica, a prospering fruit merchant who came to Louisiana from the islands of Malta. J.P. was raised in the Machica fruit business and helped develop it into a successful shipping and wholesaling empire. According to legend, Peter Carvana managed to return home from prison two decades later and appeared to Marietta, who had presumed him dead. Marietta suffered an emotional breakdown as a result of the encounter and never recovered. Carvana was subsequently found murdered. Young J.P. involved himself in the wanton politics of his day. He served as an enforcer for the local democratic machine known as the Ring, before becoming a soldier and privateer for the Confederate cause in the Civil War. After the war, he organized an anti-African-American political militia. Known as the Innocents, the militia became J.P.'s private underworld organization. It was responsible for bloody acts against the French Quarter's African-American community in the weeks leading up to the 1868 presidential election. As a captain affiliated with the conservative Democratic White League, J.P. led his largely Sicilian militia in a pivotal role in 1874's Battle of Liberty Place. About 1890, J.P. and New Orleans Chief of Police David Hennessy backed opposing sides in a gang war between stevedore firms under the control of rival mafia clans, the Matrangas and the Provenzanos. Late in the evening of October 15th of that year, Hennessy was assassinated on his way home from work. Nineteen men, including J.P., were indicted as principals and accessories in the killing. Nine of those, J.P., Charles Matranga, Antonio Scafidi, Bastiano Incardona, Pietro Monasterio, Antonio Marchese and his teenage son Asperi, Antonio Bagnetto, and Manuel Polizzi, were brought to trial in February 1891. Charles Matranga was regarded by many in the Crescent City, including Chief Hennessy, as the leader of the Mafia faction known as the Stupigieri. Damning evidence was introduced against several of the defendants. While J.P. was clearly not present at the attack on Hennessy, his own words and actions indicated sympathy and complicity with the Hennessy assassins. Still, on March 13th, the jury led by Foreman Seligman found none of the nine guilty. An editorial in the Daily Picayune called the verdict a thunderburst of surprise to the masses. Others called it evidence of jury bribery. In fact, authorities already knew that members of the jury pool had been offered bribes. Undercover agents, planted within a detective firm employed by Charles Matranga and among the Sicilian inmates at Orleans Parish Prison, alerted prosecutors to defense efforts at jury tampering. After the verdict, the nine defendants were held in parish prison overnight on a legal technicality. That provided time for William Sterling Parkerson, leader of an elitist reform political movement, to announce a mass meeting for the next morning at the statue of Henry Clay on Canal Street. He also organized a small party of vigilantes known as the Regulators, armed it with Winchester repeating rifles, and wrote out a list of eleven prisoners he believed ought to be lynched to correct the unjust verdict. In these endeavors, he appears to have been aided by James D. Houston, leader of the corrupt Democratic ring that Parkinson had been trying for years to reform. How Parkinson came up with the list remains a puzzle. That Houston might have had a hand in it is certainly a possibility. The mass meeting drew an excited crowd numbering in the thousands. Aroused through several fiery speeches, the throng advanced toward Parish Prison. As the mob surrounded the building, Parkerson's select group forced their way into the institution and began the hunt for the eleven men on Parkerson's list. With no time to move the captives to safety, prison officials opened their cell doors and advised them to hide themselves as well as they could from the regulators. Manuel Polizzi was the first to be discovered. He was shot once as he cowered in a jail cell. Then he was dragged outside to be publicly hanged. The mob did a sloppy job, and it took three tries to successfully hoist Polizzi up a lamppost. Some in the crowd celebrated their triumph by ripping at Polizzi's clothing and shooting at his dying body. 
A squad of regulators then cornered seven men in the prison's central courtyard. As the helpless prisoners pleaded for mercy, the vigilantes opened fire at close range. Antonio Bagnetto and Pietro Monasterio fell, along with five indicted men who had not yet stood trial. Those five could not possibly have been associated with the injustice Parkerson claimed to be correcting. Bagnetto, barely alive, was tied up and taken out to be hanged from a tree. His hanging took only two tries, the first being thwarted by a weak tree limb. His body, too, was used by the mob for target practice. J.P., Scafidi, and Antonio Marchese fled upstairs to the third story of the prison, a section reserved for condemned prisoners. Curiously, Marchese's son, Asperi, remained behind at his assigned cell. It appears the prisoners were forewarned of the names on Parkerson's list. Scafidi strayed too near the open side of the gallery overlooking the central courtyard and was struck and killed by a rifle shot. However, both J.P. and Marchese appear to have been dispatched by an unknown gunman located on the third floor gallery with them. Marchese was mortally wounded to the skull by the blast from a weapon that also took off three of his fingers. Had he been close enough to the attacker to grab the muzzle of the weapon? Marchese lingered near death for hours before succumbing. At the moment his life ended, J.P. was working furiously to smash open the lock of a door that blocked his way. Early reports said he was killed by the strike of a blunt object on the back of his head. An initial examination of J.P.'s body showed no visible wound. The coroner later found an unbleeding bullet hole behind his left ear. Could that have been a coup de grace shot from one of Parkerson's men? With the targets on his list taken care of, Parkerson appeared before the crowd and announced that justice had been done. Unmolested in the attack, however, were Asperi Marchese, Charles Matrenga, Matrenga Lieutenant Bastiano in Cardona, and six other men implicated in the Hennessy assassination. Matrenga and Asperi Marchese apparently were so convinced Parkerson's men would not harm them that while the other prisoners scrambled frantically for a hiding place, they did not bother to leave their cells. Despite Parkerson's assurances to the crowd, the Matrenga Mafia remained very much intact. On the other hand, the remains of J.P.'s empire were carved up by his former allies, including James D. Houston. Local political leaders also set about sullying J.P.'s reputation. His heroic actions on behalf of his home state were forgotten, as the native New Orleanian was repeatedly depicted as an immigrant Sicilian mafioso. After the lynchings, Parkerson told the press he hadn't intended for any of the men on his list to be shot within the prison. He said he planned to take them outside and publicly try them before the assembled mob. That his regulators departed so dramatically from the plan raises the question of the group's true leadership. Had Parkerson's force actually been organized to correct the jury bribery injustice, or did it serve some other purpose, perhaps one unknown even to Parkerson himself? Deepwater, Joseph P. Machika and the Birth of the American Mafia, by Thomas Hunt and Martha Machika Sheldon, explores the many mysteries of J.P.'s life and death. It is available for purchase through Amazon.com and other book retailers. For more information about Machika and the early New Orleans Mafia, visit www.jpmachika.com.